Kia ora everyone. Welcome to this Good Fellow Unit webinar on the screening, prevention and monitoring of colorectal cancer. This webinar is kindly supported by Mercy Ascot. We have three expert speakers on our panel this evening. Maggie chapman Ow is a gastroenterologist and advanced endoscopist with extensive expertise in diagnostic and therapeutic colonoscopy, including bowel screening, polyp removal and diagnosis of bowel cancer. Kylie Russell, who's a specialist surgical and gastroenterology prescribing dietitian with experience across a variety of medical and surgical specialties. And Julian Hayes, a colorectal and general surgeon with expertise including bowel and laparoscopic surgery, colorectal diagnostic and therapeutic colonoscopy. And Maggie will start off the session for us. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Helen. Um, so thank you to everyone who's joining in. My session or my part of the session is um, on colorectal cancer screening. Uh, obviously, I don't plan to uh, cover this very extensive topic in 15 minutes, but I thought what I would do uh, is really highlight um, the, the major um, benefits we've been seeing through the screening program and I guess some special scenarios uh, which might be you know interesting for discussion. So as Helen mentioned, um, I'm a gastroenterologist um, and I have both public and private commitments. In private, I work with Auckland Gastroenterology Associates. Uh, we're based at Mercy um, in Epsom. Uh, and I do my procedures both in Epsom and Takapuna. I'm also uh, at Auckland City Hospital as a gastroenterologist and as part of the advisory team for our local NBSP service. And I also do um, lecturing for the university. So uh, this is a, just a little bit of um, uh, revision, if you like, just to start off the talk. Um, so the stages of colorectal cancer, obviously there are four stages. Um, and uh, with our local national data, this is the uh, distribution of cancer staging at diagnosis. So these are patients who are diagnosed uh, through the symptomatic pathway mostly. And you can see that it is a fairly um, well or evenly distributed across all four stages. Uh, in particular, uh, in stage four, which is the most advanced stage, you have about a quarter of people presenting uh, with stage four colorectal cancer. <clears throat> Uh, here, I'd like to just briefly show you the um, five-year uh, survival data, uh, just to emphasize the importance of the stage at which people are diagnosed. So on this side, on the left side, um, you have the five-year survival data for colon, uh, for colon cancer, and on the right side, you have for rectal cancer. And this is data um, between 2010 and 2014 uh, for various countries, which are, I guess, in some ways, very similar to uh, to New Zealand in terms of its um, uh, service uh, health provisions and also the demographics. So you can see that obviously with increasing stage, the five-year survival drops, uh, where obviously you get the best survival in stage one, and then it drops quite significantly in stage four, uh, where it can be um, only up to 20% uh, five-year survival. So the key point of that is obviously the uh, earlier we diagnose uh, colorectal cancer, the better the outcomes, which, which is you know, a simple concept, uh, really. Now, if we look at, uh, this shows the percentage of people who are eligible for um, a FIT test and those who come with a positive result. So between 2018 and 2022, the data here shows that on average, um, around 4 to 5% of the eligible population who have a FIT test will have a positive result. Um, the result is the percentage is higher in those um, who are having it for the first time. So, uh, and that makes sense. Obviously those who are having it uh, as their first test, the population there are more likely to have a, a positive result compared to those who have already been in the program and are going through the two yearly cycle. Um, so about four to five percent of people you would expect uh, who have a fit test will have a positive result. <clears throat> so what does a positive result in, um, usually result in, in terms of the diagnosis? And it's important to stress that uh, a positive fit test 
does not mean that they have cancer. We do find a number of other pathologies. Um, so here is a breakdown of the, I guess, from a colorectal cancer point of view, the uh, pathology related to polyp findings and cancer diagnosis. I just want to, before I go through the data, point out that this is the um, most significant pathology that is found at the colonoscopy. So uh, what the ministry documents uh, is the what they call the most significant pathology. So for example, if someone has a cancer and they also have um, advanced polyps, then the cancer is considered uh, the most significant pathology and so forth. So in terms of cancer being the, the um, main diagnosis at colonoscopy, uh, through the country, it is about 6 to 7%. I've just shown you our, our local Auckland um, uh, DHB data there as well, which is a little higher, but it is averages about 6 to 7%. So 6 to 7% of people with a positive fit test uh, will have a bowel cancer. And that's a, a, a fairly um, useful number to remember um, because obviously when uh, we are counselling patients who have a positive fit test, it puts into perspective um, you know, the, the risk of finding a cancer when they proceed to a colonoscopy. Then uh, for those who have an advanced uh, adenoma, so these are high grade adenomas or uh, large adenomas, um, the proportion of people who have this is about just over um, a quarter. So between a quarter to 30% will have an advanced adenoma. And then this just shows you cumulatively people who have either a combined, uh, sorry, a cancer, an advanced adenoma or an adenoma, about two thirds to 70% of people. So it is fair to say that uh, this group of people who have positive fit tests are um, more likely to have uh, adenomas or advanced adenomas detected uh, as well as cancer. Here we have um, just data from uh, my, our local ADHB. Uh, comparing uh, the stages of cancer that we are finding for those people who are coming uh, for screening compared to those who are um, uh, diagnosed. So uh, in, in the year 2021 uh, and 2022, they're blue and orange indicated here. So you might recall the initial um, table or, or graph that I showed you at the beginning, that it's roughly um, divided between all four stages and those who are presenting um, symptomatically. But in screening, um, as we anticipate, we are finding a lot more early stage cancers. So uh, you can see that um, just over half of people or between 50 to 60% of people who have a screening detected cancer um, are presenting with a stage one cancer. So mm. this is very good news. It means that they're having their cancers detected early. Uh, whereas in stage four, uh, in, in 2021, we had no stage four cancers. And then in 2022, we had 10% of, of those uh, at stage four. So this is a, a very different um, distribution, if you like, of the stages that people are presenting with when they have a screen detected bowel cancer. Um, this shows you the participation rate. So I think participation is something that we constantly work at and uh, we obviously encourage um, through the community and, and rely on support of GPs to um, constantly work at our participation rates. So participation rates, um, here we show the um, participation rates for Auckland DHB compared to um, the rest of the country. And this is the entire eligible population. So we have a participation rate through the country of anywhere between 50 and 60%. So about two thirds of people who are invited to have a fit test will go on and, and have that done. And of course, there are priority populations as well that are that are identified, so Māori and Pacifica. Um, the participation rates are lower, and uh, that is something that is constantly being worked at at the community. Uh, but we have, uh, for example, at Auckland DHB, we've been working hard, the BSP team and the community teams have been working hard to engage um, these populations. So you can see that um, between December 2022 and May 2023, there has been slight increase in our participation rates for Māori and Pacifica. So participation rates are still um, uh, lower in, in the priority populations. Uh, and, and we are aiming obviously to get that to meet uh, the general participation rates for the, for the entire population. 
So um, this shows you the breakdown of what happens after a positive fit test. So um, not everyone who has a positive fit test will end up having a colonoscopy. This is the data for the entire New Zealand. And uh, about 80% of people will go on to have a screening colonoscopy under the BSV program. There's a small percentage uh, of around seven to eight percent who will have it in the private sector. About two percent of them will actually end up having it under the symptomatic pathway. And this is because uh, these individuals have already been referred uh, as well for a procedure because of, of symptoms. So they uh, will end up having a colonoscopy under the symptomatic pathway. Uh, small percentages, well, 3% will undergo a CT colonography, and there are a number of reasons why this turns out to be the case. Uh, sometimes it is due to comorbidity, so a patient may not be uh, appropriate for colonoscopy because of comorbidities um, or other risk factors. Uh, and there are a small number of people who, after discussion with the BSP team, may elect not to have a colonoscopy and they uh, will then choose to have a CT colonography. Obviously, a CT colonography is not, has not been shown to be uh, equivalent to colonoscopy for screening purposes. So that is one of the things that, that you know, we discuss with the patient in terms of uh, CT colonography um, not necessarily being comparable as a screening investigation. We have a small percentage of people who decline any further investigation and are discharged um, from the service. Um, and the number of the reasons vary somewhat in terms of why people decline uh, proceeding with investigation. And then um, another small percentage, 4% uh, of people who will be deemed unsuitable for investigation. Uh, and that can be a multi multitude of reasons. For example, it may be due to comorbidities, uh, or it may be, as I'll come to later in the talk, uh, due to other factors. For example, they may have had a colonoscopy within the last two to five years, um, or there are certain criteria. For example, they may not actually um, you know, be a New Zealand resident. Um, while, um, while we're on the slide, I just would like to briefly um, mention about uh, screening colonoscopy in the private sector. So we, as you know, in the previous slide, there are some people who choose to have their colonoscopy uh, in the private sector after a positive fit test. And um, I think it's important to appreciate that not, uh, that colorectal cancer screening is not only about the colonoscopy. Um, so the, it, it is, a, is a journey for the patient from the time they have the colonoscopy to what might eventuate afterwards. So for example, at Mercy Ascot, um, uh, we have a number of other services. So we have uh, very good colorectal surgeons such as Julian himself, uh, who provide um, uh, access to uh, multidisciplinary input uh, in terms of patients referred with colorectal cancer. Then we have good imaging as well, easy access to imaging and uh, oncology service such as chemotherapy and radiotherapy. The important thing to realize as well with screening colonoscopy is that um, under the BSB program, uh, screening endoscopies are accredited and audited as part of the screening program, as well as time allocation for screening colonoscopy is longer than your standard colonoscopy to allow time to deal with polyps, etc. cetera. Um, I'd like to touch on a, a handful of um, special scenarios, I guess, just because of the limitations in time. I guess these are some of the things that might be of interest. Um, at times we may get people who uh, ask about having a fit test, uh, uh, either a self-funded fit test that is outside of the screening program or sometimes patients who've had a positive FOBT. Um, these patients may um, also be outside age criteria. And this is a um, difficult um, issue to address in the sense that obviously they will not be they will not meet criteria to have a screening colonoscopy under the BSB program. But on the other hand, you have a patient who, uh, you know, potentially um, may have significant or an underlying serious pathology. So I think this sometimes is a difficult scenario where the patient is um, left with uh, um, limited avenues in terms of what to do following that positive result. 
Um, I've, I can't obviously speak for all DHBs. I think that it, it is something that, um, you know, one could consider either referring for a symptomatic procedure if the patient has symptoms. I think it's important to um, ask if there are any symptoms that the patient could be referred for, or for example, uh, if they have iron deficiency anemia, which would also meet criteria for a symptomatic colonoscopy. Um, and then, of course, there's the um, availability through the private sector as well. Um, I guess one of the things I'd like to point out is that uh, the age criteria set by the screening program obviously is, is, a, is, is something that um, is uh, influenced by other factors, including resource um, provisions, etc. But it's important to realize that um, for Maori and non-Maori, but especially in Maori population, the current cutoff uh, for, for screening is 60, although as you might know, it will be lowered for, for Maori um, to 50. But even so, you can see that this shows you the percentage of people cumulative over age uh, presenting with colorectal cancer. So under 50 for Maori, for example, uh, it can be up to 30% of people who will have colorectal cancer before the age of 50. And in non-Maori, um, at the age of 60, you can see that uh, about 45 to 50% of people will, will have, um, are at risk of getting colorectal cancer before the age of 60. So the age criteria is obviously part of the screening program, but uh, there are obviously that ongoing risk of colorectal cancer, even uh, outside of the, the age um, that has been set by the screening program. Uh, a negative fit test, I think, um, although reassuring, it's important to realize it is not a guarantee. Um, and there, this shows you um, some data uh, in terms of the sensitivity of our BSP fit test compared to um, various other modalities. So this is the sensitivity of uh, New Zealand's BSP fit test over um, four years and it averages to about 80%. So about 80% of people with a bowel cancer will have a positive fit test. So that means if you'd like to look at it conversely, about 20% of people will not have a positive fit test despite having a, an underlying cancer. And if you compare this, this is data from the States uh, in terms of sensitivity of different modalities. Uh, for example, compared to colonoscopy, you see that in purple, this shows you the sensitivity for bowel cancer, and it is 95%, uh, um, which is um, not surprisingly higher than, than a, a screening fit test, but also important to realize that the detection of polyps or adenomas uh, are not um, comparable between colonoscopy and fit test. So for example, advanced adenomas, which is anything 10 millimeters or greater in green, um, the detection of that is much lower or the sensitivity of that is much lower in the fit test compared to colonoscopy. And um, so, yes, yeah, so negative fit test is not a guarantee. It's important to realize that it's not appropriate for certain higher risk groups. So I'll talk uh, about that when we talk about surveillance in the next couple of slides. Um, so it's not appropriate for high risk groups. Also remember the symptomatic pathway if patients have symptoms, um, regardless of, uh, even if they might have had a fit test, even if it's negative, they should be referred based on the symptomatic pathway. There's the surveillance pathway as well. And uh, there is the, the role of screening colonoscopy. So this is people who go straight to colonoscopy for screening as opposed to having a fit test. And this is covered by some insurance companies as well. So um, as I said, a negative fit test is not a guarantee. And this is particularly important for people who are under surveillance because they do represent a higher risk group. A fit test is, is not comparable to colonoscopy for detection of polyps. So people who have a history of polyps or adenomas uh, should have ongoing surveillance and should not um, really be falsely reassured with a negative fit test. Other criteria for surveillance, obviously patients with IBD, uh, those with a, a personal or family history of syndromes and a family history of colorectal cancer. I don't want to um, spend a lot of time going through this. This is easily accessible um, online in terms of the criteria for polyp surveillance, but just so you know that there, there are um, updated um, surveillance criteria for adenomas and serrated polyps. 
And family history, just to simplify it, because you might know the documentation is, is sometimes a bit complicated, but in simple terms, uh, a first degree relative under 55, or if you have at least two first degree relatives at any age, or if you have lots of relatives on the same side, those are the three key groups, if you like, uh, of people who should have regular surveillance colonoscopy um, as their follow up. Syndromes, um, there are a number of syndromes, but I think the two main syndromes to be aware of are the serrated polyposis syndromes and those who have oligopolyposis. So this is a term we use for people with lots of adenomas. I put Lynch and HNPCC in brackets because actually uh, Lynch patients and HNPCC patients are really managed through the familial GI cancer service. So they have regular recalls that are uh, organized by the familial GI cancer service. So probably they won't really need um, you know, too much um, involvement from GPs to, to send reminders out. But the polyposis um, patients uh, are usually the ones who don't have a particularly um, robust recall system at times. So they're the ones that you know, one should be mindful uh, that their recalls are, are, are up to date. And finally, this uh, criteria, colonoscopy in the last five years is an exclusion criteria. Um, in people who have a positive fit test. So if you have a positive fit test and you've had a colonoscopy within the last five years, although for Auckland DHB is the last uh, two years, then you are um, excluded from having another screening colonoscopy. Um, but I do say that it, it does depend a lot on the quality of your previous colonoscopy. So things like bowel preparation, whether they've uh, um, had adequate uh, uh, quality of colonoscopy, um, that should be considered. Uh, any flat polyps uh, can be missed, um, even in a quality colonoscopy. And, and of course, uh, interval cancers and miss rates are recognized. Um, uh, percentage of, of people who've had colonoscopies, even if, if done by a quality endoscopist. So I'd like to conclude and uh, say that um, screen detected colorectal cancers are found at an earlier stage, which will translate to better treatment outcomes. We encourage participation and we uh, obviously rely on, on GP and community um, supports to uh, continue this participation in the screening program. Uh, a positive fit test um, it's important to have that detailed discussion with the patient as to what this means and uh, that there is a 67% risk of cancer, but it doesn't mean that they uh, have a cancer. In fact, the majority of them won't have a cancer. A negative fit test is not a guarantee, so always be mindful of symptoms and whether the individual is at a higher risk population, such as those who require regular surveillance. And there are some circumstances which um, currently are not necessarily um, easily addressed as part of the screening program. So these are people who have a positive FOBT or self-funded fit test outside of the program and those who have had a recent colonoscopy. Thanks so much, Mehdi. That's fantastic and um, a really good lead in to the next couple of speakers. So Kylie, I think we're going to go to you and um, keep sending your questions and we'll answer them towards the end. Thanks, Maggie. I certainly learned a few things. Um, great. Well, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Kylie. I'm a dietitian working across uh, private and public practice. Um, and I'm really, you know, um, grateful to have the opportunity to chat to you about something I'm super interested in, um, in terms of the role of, you know, diet and preventing uh, bowel cancer. Uh, but I thought I'd better start off by, you know, being pretty upfront and saying, actually, you know, answering questions like this through nutrition research are actually really hard. Um, it's really hard to do, you know, um, eating is really complicated and humans are really complex. Um, uh, but even if you were to do sort of a controlled experiment, you know, for a, a short period of time, which is probably what you could manage with a human in the in the lab eating a particular diet, you know, wouldn't tell us much about, um, you know, health over the long term, which is what we're really interested in. It's what we do over our entire lifespan, which um, makes a difference, um, which is why um, in the nutrition um you know, space, we do really have to rely heavily on um, epidemiology um, in terms of getting data in terms of um, what might be um, preventing um, cancers and, and what we can modify in terms of our lifestyle. Um, now, okay. Yeah, and so this is where I think um, the work that the, the World Cancer Research Fund uh, do is really important. Um, 
this is a not-for-profit organization um, that really looks at the role of diet, physical activity, and weight in um, preventing but also surviving cancer. Um, and they've put together a really nice uh, detailed report um, um, in, in this space in terms of you know, preventing colorectal cancer, which has looked at you know, 99 studies and included over 29 million adults. Um, so in terms of um, you know, epidemiological data, this is as substantial as it gets um, and you know, just under 250,000 cases of colorectal cancer. So they've reviewed all of this and put together a report um, which was um, published through you know, um, an expert panel that reviewed the data and has made recommendations. So I thought we might look at this today. Um, so what they have shown is that um, there is things that we're doing that there is they think there is strong evidence uh, for. Um, and this is things like you know, physical activity um, reduces risk of developing colorectal cancer, um, having a diet that's high in whole grains, high in dietary fiber and uh, lots of dairy products we think is beneficial. Um, and then there's things that we're consuming that um, it's thought that increases our risk. Um, and this is things like red meat, processed meat, um, alcohol, uh, being overweight or obese, um, and being tall, although I'm not sure what I, <laughs> what I can do about that. Um, and then they have other recommendations where there is some evidence um, that we think um, it might be having effect on uh, development of this cancer. Um, that's foods containing vitamin C may reduce risk, you know, uh, lots of oily fish may reduce risk, vitamin D um, may reduce risk, multivitamin supplements, not sure, and um, they go on later in the report to say, let's just focus on the food, we think that's more useful, um, and then things that might increase risk are things like low consumption of low starch vegetables and fruits um, may increase the risk, and that what they're really trying to say there is that, you know, not enough of your colourful watery um, vegetables and too much of, you know, your starches, your potatoes and Kumara and taro and, and those sorts of things. So we're wanting more of the, the salad and the colorful fruits and vegetables. Um, and also foods containing, containing heme iron. So I thought we'd just have a quick look at the um, points where there's that stronger evidence. Um, so the first one is around being physically active, reduces the risk um, of colorectal cancer. And this is really based around the World Health Organization guidelines of um, having 150 minutes of moderate intensity uh, activity every week. Um, and we know that physical activity reduces adiposity and this improves, um, you know, reduces um, insulin resistance um, and inflammation, both of which are linked to the development of colorectal cancer. Um, but we're not really sure whether physical activity that's not accompanied by weight loss or maintenance of a healthy weight um, is as effective. Um, but that's where that's where the epidemiology can't answer those sort of mechanistic questions for us. Uh, but none the same, being active is, um, is good. Um, we also think that physical activity um, sort of helps shake everything down a bit and helps with transit time. Um, although again, we don't have mechanistic data for that. Um, being overweight or obese increases the risk of all cancers, um, including colorectal cancer. Um, and this is, you know, um, a significant problem. Um, we know that higher, you know, adiposity is associated with changes in hormones, in particular insulin, um, and excess insulin can promote the growth of cancer cells. Um, we also know that, you know, excess adiposity stimulates the body's inflammatory response and inflammation can promote uh, development of colorectal cancer. Um, and, you know, it's a big problem. <laughs> you know, it's predicted that by, you know, 2035, you know, over half of the world's global population will be overweight or obese. Um, so this is not going um, anywhere and it's going to contribute to the burden of all these other chronic disease um, as well. And it's quite interesting, interesting, and I'm not pointing the, the finger at anyone here and myself and dietitians, I think, are included in this. But, um, you know, the, the data would show that we're actually not very good at actually having the conversation and, and you know, actually diagnosing um, obesity with our, our patients and our clients. Um, and we're sort of even worse at arranging follow up around actually, you know, um, uh, treating um, that obesity as a, as a chronic disease. Um, and this was some data that I came across um, that actually has changed my practice and I thought was quite um, eye-opening for me. And it's, uh, it's survey data, um, so asking healthcare professionals, you know, why they didn't, you know, raise um, the issue of obesity um, with, the, with a patient or a client, and then they've asked the, the patient as well, you know, what their response were, so was, so, you know, um, firstly, it wasn't addressed by the clinician because they, it was perceived that the patient didn't 
feel motivated to lose weight. So 68% of us thought that, but actually compared to only 20% of people living with obesity weren't motivated. So actually they're really highly motivated. Um, our perception was that um, the patient was in quite good health um, and they didn't really have comorbidities of their obesity when actually that gets compared to only 10% only of um, people living with obesity think that. Um, there's more important issues um, to address and you know often someone gets referred for something else right or they come in um, but actually only 16% of people living with obesity in this survey thought that there was any more pressing issues than addressing their weight um, and again the last point just around not interested in losing weight and you know, the perception is people aren't interested but actually you know the vast majority are um, so that has you know that's changed my practice and I'm much more um, uh, you know uh, forthcoming with raising it and obviously it has to be done really sensitively um, but I think um, it's just worth thinking about because it is so important in a developing cancer. Uh, moving on to the diet uh, side of things you know we know that consuming whole grains uh, reduces the risk of colorectal cancer um, and it's you know, whole grains are the uh, uh, means that we've got the whole part of the of the seed, which contains the bran, uh, the germ, and the endosperm. So in there, you've got fiber, and there you've got vitamins, and lots of other various bioactive nutrients, which we think um, have plausible anti-carcinogenic uh, properties. Um, closely linked to whole grains is dietary fiber, but you know, you get dietary fiber and fruits and vegetables and, and so forth as well. Um, and we know that fiber is really important, especially as it moves into the small bowel and becomes fermented. Um, and byproducts of that fermentation are things like short chain fatty acids, such as butyrate, which have been shown in experimental studies to have you know, anti-proliferative um, effects for colorectal um, cancer cells. Um, Dietary fiber is also really good because it in, increases the bulk of the stool, which increases um, transit time, but also means there's less room for other kind of um, eustigens in there around to interact with the uh, colon uh, mucosa. Um, high fiber diets also reduce insulin resistance, um, which we think might be a, a risk factor for colorectal cancer. So the recommendations in terms of fiber um, uh, sit at quite a high uh, target of, a rate of aiming for around 30 grams a day um, and 400 grams of fruit and vegetables every day. Now to achieve these targets you really have to be having fruits and vegetables in all of your meals and I've just put together two examples because it's sort of hard to kind of confine your head you know in terms of a high fiber diet and a low fiber diet so on the the top line there I've just put a, a very sort of typical you know um, diet you might have you know marmite on toast for breakfast you get one and a half grams for that uh, maybe I don't know a roll up went in a school lunchbox somewhere one day uh, you know not much fiber from that but better for lunch you've got a wrap and some chicken and some rocket maybe and um, avocado in there four grams um, and then dinner it might have been a you know bacon carbonara sort of pasta kid friendly something or other um, and 100 grams of pasta is roughly you know five grams of fiber but you know that a day like that which is not too atypical I wouldn't say you know is only around 11 grams of fiber but you can see down on the bottom line you know you're having to aim for about 10 grams of fiber per meal plus some extra from a snack and so it's really just getting getting the veggies in right throughout the day because there's not enough room just to catch up at dinner or at a particular meal um, to reach that target um, consuming dairy products um, is thought to reduce the risk of developing uh, colorectal cancer um, and so there's inverse associations in the epidemiological data and the benefit is thought to be largely attributed to um, the uh, calcium in the dairy products um, but of course there are other bioactive substances you know um, including the short chain fatty acid um, butyrate which we know is um, protective Oh, so now onto the things that um, increase the risk of colorectal cancer. Unfortunately, um, red meat um, has been shown to, and a lot of this is around how we cook our red meat. Uh, cooking meats at high temperatures um, leads to the formation of um, heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which have been linked to uh, cancer development. Um, red meat is always also very rich in heme iron, um, which has been shown to promote um, cancer cell development. Um, and then also, um, you know, when you've got your meat on the barbecue and the fats that sort are of dripping down into the flames and the flames are sort of coming back up into the meat, you know, um, those flames are actually contain polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which stick to the surface of the food um, and are, are carcinogenic. Um, and very closely related to red meat is processed meat. Um, you know, high consumption of processed meat is um, 
uh, thought to be promoting um you know cancer um and it's due to the fats it's due to how we cook it um you know as we've already just mentioned but also these other kind of um exogenously derived in nitroso compounds which we think have carcinogenic potential in them um, so the recommendations based on the red meat and the processed meat kind of data are to limit red meat to no more than three portions per week um, and no more than, you know, 350 to 500 grams of um, red meat over the course of that week. Um, and in terms of the processed meat, so that's, you know, your bacon, salami, you know, ham and, and things like that, um, they're really recommending that you limit it or even go so far as to avoiding it. Um, yeah. Then there's alcohol, um, you know, consuming alcohol um, increases the risk of colorectal cancer. And, you know, it's thought that the, uh, the main um, toxic metabolite of alcohol, acetaldehyde, you know, disrupts the DNA synthesis um, and so can contribute to a carcinogenic cascade. Um, higher ethanol consumption also induces oxy oxidative stress and reactive oxygen species. Um, and so forth and then even high consumption so maybe you know talking about alcoholics and things like that actually you know results in displacement of nutrition altogether and, and uh, lack of nutrition intake through food um, as well so the recommendation um, uh, in terms of alcohol is that really there is no actual safe intake in terms of prevention um, and so it's best not to drink alcohol if you're wanting to prevent um, cancer so this is the summary um, of all of um, the above and what uh, the World Cancer Research Fund put out, keeping a healthy weight, keeping physically active, eating a better diet, uh, limiting fast foods, which I haven't really touched on, but it's quite intuitive, limiting red meat and processed meat, you know, to the no more than three times a week for the red meat, cutting back on sugary drinks, obviously that's going to lead to, you know, insulin and metabolic uh, problems, um, limiting alcohol um, consumption and avoiding if you're really aiming for prevention, if that's your goal. Um, I didn't really spend too much time on the supplements, but, you know, they go on to say in the report that, you know, maybe it does something, but probably it's best just to focus on getting our nutrition through diet um, and to breastfeed um, if possible. But I think you could, you know, really summarize all of that in terms of, you know, aiming for quality over quantity and really focusing on unprocessed um, whole foods. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kylie. That's fantastic. And some really great um, practical examples of, of what we can replace those foods for. So we, we will move on to Julian now and again, come back to questions later. So I'll let you take it away, Julian. Right. So I was asked to talk about um, colorectal cancer follow-up. Um, and for fairly obvious reasons as a surgeon, this is something we do a lot. I just just as, as uh, I spend most of my time at Totoka to my at Auckland City Hospital, um, and then part and part of my weeks at Auckland Colorectal Centre, and I also do colonoscopies as well. Colorectal cancer follow up, you have to really remind yourself about why you're doing it, um, and the key is that we're wanting to de detect any bowel cancer occurrence at an early stage so that you can offer additional curative treatment and that's important um, and improve the outcome for the patient. So that really implies a whole lot of things. When I talked to my wife about this and my wife's a GP, she said what's probably worth reminding people as Maggie has done about the uh, colorectal cancer staging. Now I, what I've done here is actually look at that and describe colorectal cancer um, recurrence rates specific to New Zealand. I think that the slides Maggie did were um, some of the international data. This is data from the Piper study, which is a study that was initiated from some of my um, oncological colleagues and published um, back in 2018, so pre-COVID. Um, stage one cancer or bowel cancer is confined to the bowel wall. The, the recurrence rates for that over five years in New Zealand are five percent or less. Whereas as, as soon as it's, cancer spreads through the bowel wall and stage two, that jumps up to twenty-two percent. And then stage three, when local lymph nodes are involved, a third of patients will end up with a recurrence in the next five years. And that's even with chemotherapy. When stage four, when the cancer is metastatic and spread to other organs in the body, so usually liver or lung or ovaries or peritoneum, the recurrence rates are even higher, so up to 50%. 
there's a really important balance here to find though because i mean literally you've got a patient sitting in front of you and and all of you will have had this and i i have this on a regular basis um patient that's had a bowel cancer um and they're feeling pretty anxious about it um they may be anywhere between 40 to 80 years old and they're really wondering what their chances are of surviving with this um, typically, if they have lymph node disease, they'll have chemotherapy if their comorbidities don't preclude that. Um, but really, in terms of finding the balance, you have to get the balance between finding a treatable disease recurrence, um, but not over-investigating the patient because the, the, the data is, and there's a lot of data on this from quite Cochrane reviews pretty much over the last 20 years, that over-investigation doesn't improve outcomes. And you've got to find the balance between creating too much anxiety, both for the patient and for yourself, um, and hopefully reassuring the patient and yourself that everything's okay. And at the same time, anything that we do has got to improve quality of life, but not at the expense of massive over-investigation and massive extra resource use. So in terms of treatable, treatable recurrence, patient fitness um, and their life expectancy are relevant. Um, so, for example, if you've got a 40-year-old patient and they're in pretty good shape, most 40-year-olds will be, um, we're going to keep a really close eye on things for the next five years. If you've got an 80-year-old patient and they've got significant comorbidities, it's quite likely that even chemotherapy for them may not be a good option if they develop a recurrence. Um, and likewise, the outcomes for, you know, further redo surgery and, and over 80 year old people are generally not good and so you've got to think carefully about how how much you chase things in terms of recurrence in terms of the options for treatment for rectal cancer typically it may be radiotherapy for a recurrence for for bowel cancer generally you may be thinking about either further cytotoxic chemotherapy or immunotherapy and then the issues of um, access to treatment because often immunotherapy may not be funded outside of trials. In terms of surgery, the surgical options are, are, are more numerous now than even 10 years ago. So we have lots and lots of people that will be operating on for liver metastases, even to the, the extent that the liver surgeons these days are considering kind of actually uh, the options of transplant. And that's not happening yet, but that, that's how far it's going. Lung cancer, uh, uh, recurrences in the, in the in lungs are, are very commonly operated on or get radiotherapy. Local recurrence for rectal cancer or peritoneal recurrence can will get surgery for that. Um, if the patient's comorbidities, if it looks resectable, um, they'll get surgery for that in, 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 in Auckland. Um, and, and then finally, we've got to consider the, the, the real possibility that in some patients, um, we may actually think about palliation. So it's, it, it, all of this warrants a really good discussion with the patient in front of us. The interventions that are available in terms of surveillance or follow-up for, for colorectal cancer, you, you can't go past a good talk with the patient and in an examination. Um, and usually we would want to see them twice a year for the first two to three years and at least do an abdominal examination and definitely do a rectal examination for patients that have had a rectal cancer resected. Blood tests, the most important thing by far is CEA or carcinoembryonic antigen, and I'm going to come to back to it in a minute. Um, imaging, typically CT, chest, abdo, pelvis. We used to do a lot more. The data on this from the Cochrane reviews is that if you're doing them more than every 18 months to two years in the first two or three years, you're doing too many. That It doesn't improve the outcomes. Um, colonoscopy, Matt, Maggie's talked about that. Most important thing for colonoscopy is that the colonoscopy at the time of the initial operation was incomplete. They should have, patients should have another colonoscopy within the first year postoperatively. And typically, if it was complete, well, then they should have a colonoscopy within the first two or three years after their bowel resection. Kylie's talked about the importance of diet and also about the importance of exercise. It's important to remember that most recurrences, far and away the most recurrences, and this is again New Zealand data from the Piper study, are detected in the first two to three years post-op. So nearly three quarters of recurrences are detected in the first two years after the, the index um, operational diagnosis of the bowel cancer. Finally, I've mentioned something which is a little bit out there, but it may not be too far away. CT DNA is circulating tumor DNA. So it's basically DNA produced by 
the cancer cells in your body that is is detectable, um, but it's still in an experimental role in terms of its usefulness in detecting recurrence. So the Piper study found that you know in terms of the New Zealand situation, most far and away the most number of colorectal cancer recurrences over a five year period were detected by CEA testing. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a, it's a simple blood test. We do that every six months in the first two to three years. Um, imaging detected a third of the recurrences and clinical symptoms a little bit under a third. And most cl uh, colorectal cancer recurrences in the Piper study were in the liver, then in the lungs, and then local recurrences. Carcinoma embryonic antigen. Now, this is a non-specific tumor marker. It may be increased by a colorectal cancer. It's, it's particularly useful if it's elevated at the time of initial diagnosis of, the, of colorectal cancer. It can also, however, be increased by other cancers, such as ovarian, gastric, pancreatic, lung and breast cancer. And so that actually makes it not that helpful, in fact, not very helpful at all in terms of screening, because it also can be elevated in inflammatory bowel disease, pancreatitis, people with cirrhosis and smokers. Currently, it's not used as a screening test. There is some experimental work going on in terms of its usefulness in terms of triaging referrals for colonoscopy, but that we're not quite there yet. Now, this is really important. The normal range, and, and, and all of you kind of watching this will know this, so the normal range is, is typically around zero to three, but it does depend on the lab that's doing the test for you. And the problem is when you do a CEA and it comes back in the red zone, so it's a little bit over three or four or five, even, what does that mean? Usually it's not actually that help, helpful because the, actually the important thing about CEA is the trend is more important um, than the absolute level unless it's around 10 or more. So if it starts off, you know, under three and then it's slowly creeping up over a six to 12 to 18 month period to six, seven, eight, then we'd probably look at bringing the patient CT scan forward. Um, if it jumps up to 10, we definitely would do that. In terms of Cochrane reviews, and this is the, this, this, this evidence underpins th this whole discussion. There's been regular Cochrane reviews going on for the last 20 years in this area basically comparing intensive versus less intensive follow-up. And just to put it in the picture, traditionally in, in the Auckland era, we used to do three monthly follow-up after curative surgery for bowel cancer. In other areas elsewhere in New Zealand, there is almost no follow-up. Now, interestingly, the data is there's no overall survival benefit to really intensifying the follow-up follow after curative surgery for colorectal cancer. So Mm, between five and 10 years ago, this pushed us into actually reducing our follow-up intervals to six monthly for the first two to three years and then yearly out to five years. Um, and this is supported by the data. Interestingly, the Cochrane reviews show that even though you might get more attempts at salvage surgery, and you know surgeons love to do operations, but they don't always make a difference. You get more attempts at salvage surgery with more intensive follow-up. This is not associated with improved survival. And that's clearly important for the patient. So this is what we do these days at Totoka 2, my Auckland City Hospital, in terms of our follow-up protocol for stage one bowel cancer. We know that from the Piper study and from elsewhere, most of these patients will be far and away the, the the vast proportion of these patients will be disease free at five years. So more than 95% will be disease free at five years. The most important thing for them is actually to have a follow up colonoscopy, you know, between one to three years post op, depending on if their pre op colonoscopy was complete or not. Um, if they have any concerns or symptoms, look, we definitely see them again, um, but we don't do intensive follow up for people with stage one bowel cancer. However, if they're stage two to three um, colorectal cancer, then they'll have a six monthly clinical review for two years and then yearly out to five years. And they have a CEA blood test, most importantly, six monthly for the whole of that period. We do two CT scans at 18 months and three years post-op. We do what we call an exit CT scan at five years before we discharge them from follow-up, particularly if they've had adjuvant chemotherapy. But all of this is in the setting of uh, somebody that is up to another an operation, for example, liver surgery or lung surgery, if you find a recurrence. If there's an elevated CEA, particularly if it's up around 10, or if the trend is upward, would bring the CT scan forward. So we might do it 
earlier than 18 months or earlier than three years. Um, and we would always look to discharge them from follow-up between 75 to 80 years. Um, increasingly, these days, you're getting 80-year-old patients or 80-plus patients that are really fit. I say one to two is, a, is, is actually, it's a, that's a pretty fit 80-year-old. So, you know, probably 20, 10 to 20% of 80-year-olds would be in that category from the get-go. So it's not everybody. The take-home messages is that you have to stratify the risk for your individual patients sitting in front of you in terms of the follow-up that you're going to offer them. CEA is far and away the most useful test, and it remains so. There is, you know, CT DNA may be something on the horizon. Whether you, the patient's been seen in the private or the public system, our, our, our policies don't change. We don't hesitate to ask or refer um, the electronic referral systems that we have with Totoka to my work really well in terms of dealing with those issues, I think. And I think it's really important for individual patients to find the balance. If, if follow-up's going to increase patients' anxiety, you've got to really think about what it's going to, what the benefit of them is going to be in terms of their follow-up. Um, for the really anxious patients, it's a difficult discussion, but you, I, I always discuss within the evidence in terms of the, the reality that increasing the amount of imaging they have, not only is it not going to help, but it also can have unintended bad outcomes. So you've got to find the balance. And there's good evidence to support this. And this is some of that, uh, you know, Cochrane reviews, the Piper study, there's, it's, uh, it's all made things a lot more clear for us in this space. Thanks so much, Julian. What we'll do um, is we'll go through some questions. And first, first is for you, Julian. There's a couple of things. One was around the CEA, which is um, obviously used as a follow-up tool. Is there any place for, and, and you said specifically not for it not to be used as a screening tool, but what about in the setting of people with those, that increased risk of bowel cancer, so polyposis syndromes or family there, history? There, there is currently no evidence to support it. Okay, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So it's it's purely in that follow up tool post yeah, post diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's just not it's just not specific enough. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Um, there's a question that's come through around the differences between colon, rectal, and anal cancer, and um, I'm I'll throw that open to whoever um, Maggie or Julian with you who wants to respond to that. But it'd be good to have some definitions maybe for to speak to for for the audience tonight. Anal cancer is usually squamous cell cancer. You can get some really unusual anal cancers, but it's usually squamous cell cancer. So it's a completely different pathology from adenocarcinoma, which is, is you know, what you usually see in the colon and the rectum. Um, squamous cell cancer or anal squamous cell cancer is typically related to HPV infection. So it's 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 really the anal equivalent of cervical cancer. Um, it's hopefully something that with vaccination that we will see less and less and less of in the next 10 to 20 years. At the moment, the, the gold standard treatment for um, our anal cancer is chemo radiotherapy straight up and, and typically at 70 to 80 percent of, 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 of people with um, anal SCC will have a complete response to that and won't need anything further but if they don't have a complete response they'll we then end up needing that removed which they will end up with a permanent colostomy. There's a question here. Is there an increased risk of developing colorectal cancer with recurring diverticulitis? And I imagine there's something to do with the reduced transit time, maybe there, Kylie, that you talked about as well, but I'd be interested to hear your responses. I mean, that's a really interesting question. I mean, theoretically, you would think, yeah, with the reduced transit time, that would be really helpful. Um, yeah, definitely. But I'm not sure of any um, data on that unless, you know, Julia, Maggie. I'm not aware that there is uh, an increased risk of that. Julian, I don't know if you want to add to that, given that you, obviously the surgeons manage a lot more diverticulitis than we do. No, there's no increased risk. Um, but it's really important, and uh, you know, Maggie's colleagues and the surgeons often have the debate about, uh, look, patients that have complicated diverticulitis, it can be difficult on, on the radiology, so on the CT scan to sort out whether there's something going on that's not just diverticulitis, like is there a cancer there? So often those patients will be referred for a colonoscopy, but if the colonoscopy only shows diverticulitis, well, there's not an increased risk. Yeah, yeah. and that's 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 definite. Yeah. That's more a, di as, as Julian said, that's a diagnostic um, rather than an actual association between yeah. the two conditions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Thank you. And um, Kylie, just sticking with a bit of the, the fibre and transit time, um, there's a question around psyllium husk, which you, you may have read there. So is that something that can be used in this type of setting to get the increased dietary fibre if they're struggling with whole foods, which is what you've originally suggested? I mean, I think it's great for in, in terms of increasing fecal bulk and, you know, speeding up that transit time. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of a substitute for fruit and vegetables, you know, this is where epidemi epidemiology, you know, it doesn't give us any mechanism, you know, perhaps, you know, we need the fruit and veg because there's all the vitamins in there, you know, that are useful as well. So I think from a transit time thing, that's it's probably really beneficial, but I don't think we could use that as a substitute um, for fruits and vegetables. I think they probably provide us with other really wonderful things which are helpful as well fantastic and I know you're um also we're looking at a question here that's around the fitness and the exercise so I think um you spoke to generic exercise and someone's trying to define here is it kind of respiratory fitness is that more important than than other types of physical activity in terms of um, cancer prevention or is it just a generic um reference from the epidemiology yeah, that's based on the World Health Organization, you know, guidelines around the 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. Whether it's cardiorespiratory fitness, is big, we just don't, we just don't know. But interesting. Brilliant. Thank you. And um, maybe for you, Maggie, what what is the risk of colorectal cancer in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, so Crohn's and ulcerative colitis? And I know there's two different um, yeah. answers to that in what type of surveillance or screening would you do for them? So yes, there is an increased risk in people who have um, inflammatory bowel disease affecting the colon. So, I mean, obviously that seems uh, simplistic, but obviously in other words, if someone who has uh, perianal Crohn's or Crohn's in their small bowel, uh, but not in their colon, then they don't have the same risk of colon cancer. Um, the risk is also uh, dependent on whether there is uh, chronic inflammation or underlying activity. So someone who has well-controlled um, colitis as opposed to someone who has active colitis of varying severity. And again, and then in addition to that, the extent of the inflammation. So for example, someone who has proctitis uh, has um, no recognized increased risk. So we don't um, perform surveillance in people with proctitis compared to people with left-sided colitis or pan colitis. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, their family history of bowel cancer also increases that risk further. And if they also have uh, underlying PSC, which is a um, uh, condition affecting the bowel ducts that can sometimes coexist with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, so the, the, the risk itself varies depending on activity of disease, extent of disease, how well controlled it is, whether they have um, PSC or strictures. Uh, and the surveillance um, intervals, therefore, are determined by those factors. Um, so the surveillance, uh, typically, from the time of diagnosis, about eight or 10 years after diagnosis, they should have uh, their first um, surveillance colonoscopy. And from then on, um, the intervals vary between one, three, and five years, depending on, um, you know, the level of, of um inflammation and extent that we find on colonoscopy. Um, it's sufficient to say that, um, you know, the, the criteria for surveillance can be quite complicated and I don't expect anyone to commit it to memory, <laughs> but just to be aware that um, it's very readily available online. If people just put in New Zealand colonoscopy surveillance, they will find tables of, you know, what intervals uh, patients require. Um, Maggie, while we're on you, you've answered a question in the Q&A already, but it'd be nice maybe to speak to, to the audience around um, the active involvement in encouraging um, Māori and Pacific participation in, in fit screening. And I guess, yeah, it is an ongoing issue, but it'd be great to hear your thoughts and in, in what you've typed through here in terms of what we can do. I think, um, uh, obviously, the BSP service at, at um, uh, Te Toka Tū by Auckland uh, have, you know, both Māori and Pacific uh, health promoters, and I think um, engagement, there have been many engagement projects um, over the last couple of years to increase participation. This involves, you know, sp um, uh, special days where they uh, get the community involved, um, speaking at schools, um, making it a fun day, an activity for, you know, local community to come and learn more about it. And I think, you um, 
uh, a lot of it is about raising awareness, um, making sure that it's, you know, something that isn't a, a frightening um, experience for them, because I think there is a lot of um, lack of, not, not necessarily lack of awareness, but also um, lack of understanding what, you know, screening involves and what colonoscopy involves, what the treatment of, of colorectal cancer involves. So I think um, participation is, you know, as you say, an ongoing thing that needs to be worked at. It's, it's not necessarily something that, you know, can be achieved uh, over a limited period of time. But um, certainly at um, Auckland DHB, the, the um, increase in, in community engagement has definitely translated to higher participation rates. Thank you. Kari, I see you nodding and I'm going to throw to you because um, I am interested. So uh, classic ham sandwiches in the lunch boxes, really easy and quick for a parent and um, kids love it. So I guess... You know, if we are trying to break this habit in New Zealand, um, is there a clear uh, resource or uh, somewhere that we can direct our patients to 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 help come up with different ideas or helpful, um, you know, I guess, anti cancer um, lunchbox ideas instead? Yeah, absolutely. I was certainly raised on ham sandwiches myself, so it's a little bit <laughs> see how that transpires. But um, yeah, I mean, look. Good resources are places like the New Zealand Nutrition Foundation, which have like some really simple kind of like recipe ideas in terms of kids' lunchbox ideas and things like that. Um, and, you know, I think it's just getting a bit more um, creative. I mean, I think another big challenge is something that would be super easy to send kids to school with would be peanut butter. But with the nut allergies, that's sort of really difficult as well. So you're left with things like marmite and cheese and then th things like that. But I think trying to get plants in early, I think, is a really good way and being a bit more creative in as well in terms of getting you know things like avocado and hummus and and things and like that and just even stepping outside the sandwich thing I know it's quick and easy um but you know just being a bit more creative with even like dinner leftovers if you can just make that extra little box you know the night before of what you're you're making and then it's already done it's already boxed ready to go so you just have to grab it in the morning um and I think you know little things like that veggie sticks you know getting them snacking on things like that rather than the packets and you know just getting the, the processed food out as much as we can as early as we can so that we'd establish, you know, establish these good habits that, you know, um, eventuate over a lifetime, I think, you know, should make a difference. But yeah, have a look at the New Zealand Nutrition Foundation. The Health Navigator website has really good um, information as well. Um, but yeah, it's, um, those are probably the two that I'd recommend. Yeah. Thank you. I love your slide where you compared the two. So it just, again, visually gives you different ideas. Um, and another question for you around, you mentioned at the very end um, around breastfeeding. And oh, yeah. uh, as you know, I, I guess that sort of you know, do, can you speak a little bit more to why that is, or you know, what, where that what the recommendation is there? Look, I mean, I don't think we know exactly why, you know, we just know that breastfeeding is good for everything, basically, you know, in terms of you know, the epigenetics and all the good microbes that you get passed from the mum to the baby through that, you know, skin to skin and through the breast milk as, as well. You know, um, I think you know, that would be really generically speaking what we'd be um, talking about there, but um, I, I don't think we've got much more data than that, yeah. Um, Maggie, it, it talks about, oh, there's a question here about testing diabetic patients earlier. Should we be screening them at an earlier age? Now, we've got that beautiful graph that talked about the reason why we're screening Māori and Pacific earlier, but is there any evidence around other populations? I'm not aware off the top of my head of any um, data that suggests we should be screening. I mean, obviously, screening is a... Is a um, uh, you know, you have to show benefit in a larger population of people, but I'm not aware of any benefit in screening diabetics. I don't know, Julian, if you... you no, no, I'm, I'm not aware of anything um, for diabetics specifically. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't know if there's any evidence that diabetes per se increases the risk of colorectal cancer. I mean, the problem is that there's a confounders of of other dietary and exercise factors in, in terms of that, um, which diabetics will be um, stuck with. Yeah, like, which... for example, obesity is, in general, associated with increased risk of various different cancers. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So the confounding factors there, but yeah. yeah, managing it in a different way. And Julian, I know you're typing an answer, but maybe maybe it's worth speaking out loud um, as to the, the stage one, four diagnosis numbers that we have. 
how do they compare internationally to what we do? Look, I, I think while we're still seeing the effects of the screening programs, because, you know, we're, they're still going in the process being rolled out across the country. I mean, the whole country is screening, but we're still in the first few years of that. We, we are still getting more stage, well, two to four cancers than comparable countries like Australia or the, or the UK. Um, so you, we, we're still seeing that, but hopefully in five to 10 years, that will be different. I think can I just say, I think the tricky thing with all of these things, there are big equity issues. Like there was a question earlier on about colonoscopy screening, and I, I don't want to be flippant, but there's a very well-known colorectal surgeon who moved from the, the UK to the US who talks about colonoscopy in, in the US as screening for rich people, which basically it is because it's it's a way of screening that is very resource heavy, whereas the fit test is not. Um, and so if you're going to screen, there there are significant equity implications, and that's why we've gone down the fit test route. And I guess the ability for us to, to ask, ask regular questions of our patients and be looking for symptoms and maybe bringing up the topics more often than um, treating sure. or screening. Oh, sure. But I suppose the other thing is just to point out the difference between screening and case finding. You know, so if someone's got symptoms, and in particular, anybody has got any symptoms that might make you think, do they have a bowel issue? So, you know, that's, yeah. Well, we'll move to the next one. Um, the dairy intake. Now, Kylie, that took me by surprise, the dairy intake, because um, I had, I guess, lumped it with red meat and dairy consumption as being a bad thing. So, I, you know, can you talk a little bit more to that? There is a question around um, what is the daily recommend dairy, recommended dairy intake, but I certainly know there'd been a throw back to, remote, to, to almost removing dairy from the diet because it got lumped in with um, animal fats. So be interested to hear a little bit more. Dairy is a um, tricky one and it does get quite a bad rap, but, you know, it is such an important, um, you know, cornerstone of our diets, you know, um, so, you know, in this context, we think calcium is really beneficial, but, you know, calcium is, our calcium recommended daily intake is actually really high, you know, um, you know, for most adults, it's around 1,000 up to 1,300 milligrams of calcium per day. So just to put that into perspective, you know, um, a glass of calcium trim milk, you know, the yellow top one, um, 250 mils of that's about 400 milligrams. So that's sort of, that's a calcium fortified food. So you'd even need, you'd need to have probably three serves of that just to even reach your recommended daily intake. Um, yogurts, you know, are, are really good, but, you know, but at least you might get 150 milligrams in a, in a pottle or something like that. So you need to be having sort of three to four serves of dairy to get enough um, calcium intake a day. In terms of like the concern around um, saturated fats, obviously it is they are derived from animals. Um, I think you need to put it in perspective in terms of other sources of saturated fats. They are comparatively low source of saturated fats. Plus you are able to choose a reduced fat um, um, alternative within each group, you know, in terms of each yogurt and each um, um, milk and things like that. But I think, you know, um, some fat, we do need some fats as well. And so fat, total exclusion of fat isn't the enemy. Um, it's about everything in moderation, but, you know, um, following the dietary guidelines around you know, a few serves of dairy a day um, is good. It's also, there's good evidence in terms of weight management as well. It's got good protein. It's quite satiating, you know. Um, so there are actually really good things um, to dairy products as well. So I wouldn't uh, throw them out altogether, um, but just making sure they've got them there in the right place is, is really important, yeah. And I guess with that, there is a, a big throw to using things like oat milk and almond milk and um, various other alternatives instead of yeah. um, dairy milk. Um, and they provide some amount of calcium, but not a, not a significant amount. Is that right? I mean, I'm yet to find an oat milk that's calcium fortified. Almond milks and soy milks are pretty good. Rice milk. Uh, yeah. So it's just um, making sure that they're on a calcium fortified plant based alternative milk is what I sort of generally check. Um, it's interesting, you know, um, I work a lot in the IBS space as well. You know, oat milk is very high in FODMAPs and poorly tolerated by a lot of people too. And so, um, you know, it's just kind of putting it all together. There's no one size fits all. It's really, you know, taking an individual kind of approach. Thank you. And um, uh, there's a last question here. And again, I don't know if we have an answer, but is there a di direct relationship between nitrates and water in colorectal cancer? Julian, you look like I, you're about I, to say I, something. I, 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 don't, I don't think there's an answer to that. I know there is some suspicion, you know, that, that this is an issue in Canterbury. I, I don't think there's any evidence, proven evidence yet, but there's some suspicion of that. I mean, you know, nitrates in food we know is a risk for GI cancer, but in water, uh, I, I'm not sure.
Look, I think we're, we've come to the end of our time and um, Julie and Maggie and Kylie, you've been amazing. Thank you. Really practical talk with lots of um, supportive uh, resources that we can take away and I think things that we can take straight into our work for our patients from tomorrow. So thank you so much for all your help and for answering all those questions. I really appreciate it. So thank you again and I hope everyone's had a wonderful evening.